You're watching Badass Lady Folk. I'm your host, Christine Stoddard. In this episode, I am so thrilled to welcome author, writer, poetess, fashionista, <laughs> Marina Rubin. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Christine. I yeah. love it here. Yeah, and I love having you here. You go with the whole ambiance, the colors, everything. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Yeah, purple, marigold. Marigold's like one of the characters in your story because you have a new-ish book, shall we say, a 2023 release, mm -hmm. Knockout Beauty and Other Afflictions. Ta-da! For those who are watching the filmed version of the show, I'm holding up a little postcard for the book, which has a gorgeous cover. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So tell me about these 17 stories of sex and travel and glamour and everything and else. drama. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to do like a modern take on Sex in the City because, you know, Sex in the City finished in 2000, I'm going to say four, and nothing has really come through since then um, in terms of writing. I mean, I know Lena Dunham have done girls uh, on television, but in terms of writing, I haven't seen anything like that. So I live in New York. I have a lot of single girlfriends. In fact, most of my uh, friends are single. And we enjoy New York City. And um, I thought this was a kind of story, the, the kind of book that's needed, modern, and very l relevant. And that's why I wanted to write it. Um, and also, you know, any kind of writing is a form of therapy. So mm. whatever, whatever I've collected, whatever n negativity or bad stuff or whatever, the best thing to do is just like splash it onto the page. Yeah. And that's what I did. So I cheated and I looked at some other interviews you had done and I noticed that you resist the term women's fiction a little bit. Could you talk about the reason why? Um, I mean, I've stopped resisting it. <laughs> well, do you find it pejorative because some people are like, uh, it's you know, chiclet, nah, nah, nah. Right. So I, I, for many years, I thought, oh, I, I don't write women's fiction because it had a very negative connotation until... I signed up with my latest publisher, and my latest publisher are two very, very heterosexual men <laughs> who, uh, you know, I, I remember I got on a Zoom call with them uh, when they were making me an offer. They were like, we love your book. And I said, really? Because I anticipated that somebody, a publishing house that would pick me up would be all strong, independent women, mm. you know, fighting for, for the right to, to, to be strong and independent. And here I have two, uh, two heterosexual kind of macho guys saying, we love your book. <laughs> and I was like, wait a second. So maybe my book has appeal uh, to a male audience. And even now that the book has come out and has gotten some great reviews and it, it has some popularity, I'd say 50% of my readers are men. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. And it's very sensual. It's very funny. Uh, <laughs> right, right. And it's I'm not necessarily putting pushing the the feminist agenda. Mm. I'm just, you know, I'm just a mirror. I'm just telling a story. Mm. And that story could be relatable, relatable to men and to women. Mm -hmm. So why why pigeonhole myself into women's fiction? Mm hmm. Hmm. So I think it worked out. But <laughs> it, before I used to kind of say, no, I don't write chiclet. Because yeah, it has yeah. so much, s such a bad reputation. Yeah. It almost downplays the, the, the craft of writing. Just because I write about women, it doesn't mean that it's less of fiction than, I don't know, Hemingway. Yeah, not that yeah, I'm comparing yeah. myself yeah. to, not that I'm <laughs> sitting here just like, I mean, why me not? And, <laughs> me and Hemingway. You do have such a way with words, of course, unsurprisingly, as a writer, and I guess... Maybe this is speculation. It comes from you being bilingual, you being a poet as well. Could you talk about your love for language and how that came about? Well, you know, English is not my first language. I was born in Ukraine, so my first language was Russian. Then I learned when I was a, a girl in school, I learned Ukrainian. And then I immigrated to the United States where I learned English. Trilingual. So, tr <laughs> well, <laughs> Russian and Ukrainian is not that much of a, uh, of a stretch. It's okay. not like French or Italian, but, you know, it's, it's, it is a different language. Um, 
So uh, when I started writing, first I started writing poetry. You know, when you're writing poetry, you're very picky in terms of words because mm -hmm. you you are in that, you know, you know. In first, you start with haikus, one line poems. Then you stretch it into a four line poem. Then it's a page. Then it's a two pager. But you're very cognizant of the words you pick. And because I had three languages under my in my tool toolbox, I often sometimes the right word actually came in a different language, mm. not in English, but in Russian because, and then I would work to translate it into English or, uh, so, you know, m my choice of, of words is very intuitive. So sometimes, um, you know, the English, the, the, the specific English word doesn't sound right, but the Russian does. So I would work hard to translate that Russian word into a, an English word was the same kind of um, uh, meaning. Mm. And so then I moved from poetry to flash fiction. Flash fiction is short storytelling in an extreme, extreme short form where, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote an entire book of stories this, this small. Mm -hmm. But that's an entire story with a plot, a character development, a, a lesson, a moral, everything. So I was even more picky in terms of my words. It was all about the economy of language. So... Uh, I love language, and I love three different languages because mm -hmm. you get to choose. Maybe I, maybe I should learn another one. <laughs> but you get to choose uh, the word that is most um, suitable for your emotion. Mm -hmm. With some of your references, I'm a little surprised that maybe you haven't picked up French or Spanish yet. <laughs> I think of the story Kaula, for instance, which is about the – well, you summarize it. You tell. Which story, I'm sorry? Kaula. The J A U L A. Jala. Okay, oh, I'm thinking well, I, of Spanish. And I know, Kala. but I, Cage. I'm thinking English. Jala. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the first story in the book, um, and it, it it means cage. Um, you know, the background on that story it, basically it's about a famous writer who comes to a very small town, mm -hmm. and um, the entire writing community comes out to see him and there's a, a young struggling attractive female writer who is in the crowd of people who comes to see him um, the actual story uh, was really based on a Russian writer mm. who came to New York um, but I just I and you know when you are in the writing circles even you might be in New York but the writing circles are very small mm -hmm. We all kind of know each other. You know, we all attend the same poetry readings. We all attend the same book signings. We all try to approach the same publishers. So <laughs> it's a small world. So instead of writing about a Russian writer coming to New York and, you know, writing about the Russian Bohemia, I decided, let, let me put them all into a small town somewhere where they speak Spanish. <laughs> just, just for... for just to change the setting a little bit, but the, the essential uh, meaning of the story remains the same, that this young, struggling uh, female writer is, is really pigeonholed into that role of a sex bot, mm. um, and, and she gets um, recognition only in relation to this famous writer. And, of course, it's all gossip, and none of it is really true, but she latches on to that opportunity and says, okay, if this is the only way to get some attention mm -hmm. from the writing community, from the editors and the publishers, well, then I'm going to grab it. Mm -hmm. And um, it is kind of a feminist story and a story of um, um, empowerment, not necessarily women's empowerment, just empowerment where you take what you're given mm -hmm. because she's a knockout beauty. And... Um, and in this case, you know, it is her affliction because no one takes her serious. She's, she's way too pretty to be a serious writer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so what she does is she takes that affliction and she turns it to her advantage. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, uh, the, the fact that I made it into all, I made the story into a spe Spanish speaking uh setting i just i just wanted to get away from the russian setting <laughs> okay although my editor said you know what you should have kept it russian hmm. 
but write what you know. <laughs> right, but, but I just I wanted to like get away from what I know and make them all Spanish. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm thinking of a less strong character, or maybe you have a different take. I'm thinking of the story Valentino mm -hmm. about the optometrist. Yes. Could you talk about that story and why you portrayed the character as you did? That that's actually a very popular story called Valentino. It's about a you know, I don't think of her as an optometrist. I think mm. of her as a serious shopaholic. <laughs> um, the fact that she's an optometrist is just, the f I, I needed to give her a profession. Mm -hmm. um, so why not an eye doctor? Um, but the key to this story is that she's a shopaholic, but in reality she's a, a, a lonely mm. uh, single woman who is, um, you know, involved in this torrid affair with a married man. And, um, you know, she has an affair and then she shops. She shops <laughs> and she has an affair. Um, and you're right. She is not the weakest character, but she's a weak mm. person in terms of um, resilience, in terms of uh, love for herself. And, um, you know, I'm not, this is just a, like a period in her life. I wouldn't think, I wouldn't mm. say that she, like, this is an enti her entire life. This is just the a certain segment of her life. I think when that story ends, when she has the realization, and mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to do a spoiler alert, but okay, yeah, I that's will. true. Let's uh, not give away too much. When <laughs> she realizes what is happening, you know, at that um, charity event, when, when she's wearing the the red Valentino, and she understands what, in a metaphorical mm -hmm. way, she suddenly uh, has an epiphany of what her life is. I think. Uh, the next day when she hits the rock bottom, from that point on, there's nowhere lower to go, but to, uh, there's nowhere to go but up. Right. So I think she will be go. She will be going place. She'll probably be, you know, finishing off that affair, and 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 uh, um and maybe she'll stop shopping. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Another incredible story that has a turn maybe is the, and now I can't remember the title, but the nose job, mm -hmm. LGBTQ yes. synagogue. Yes. What is the name of that story? You can live with this nose. Yes. <laughs> really, yes. Um, that story was meant as an inspirational story. Mm. I do, uh, um, I, I love self-help books. Mm -hmm. Uh, I always read about like Tony Robbins books or uh, right now I'm reading a book called In the Company of Women where uh, somebody interviewed 100 most influential women in America and, uh, you know, asked them questions like, um, you know, what is your biggest fear? How did you, uh, how, what, do you what does success means to you? Mm. Um, so I love inspirational stories mm -hmm. from real life. Um, and that particular story, You Can Live with, with the Snows, was meant as an inspirational story mm -hmm. for other people. You need to be looking beyond your nose. And um, because I'm very supportive the, of the LGBT community, I have close personal friends who are members of um, um, the LGBT group. And, uh, you know, some, uh, someone who is very close to me is actually a president of, a, uh, of an LGBT organization. So mm -hmm. she has invited me to um, to the synagogue, which is, uh, again, another thing, wait a second, a, a, a synagogue for LGBT people, like, w we're living in 2023, right. where, <laughs> you know, everything is possible, and, um, it, and especially in New York, where uh, communities are accepting of just who you are. Mm -hmm. um, so that story uh, was, you know, a, a rather shallow woman is there. <laughs> a very shallow woman is there, and she's concerned uh, about her nose, and she wants to get a nose job. Mm -hmm. And she's so wrapped up in her beauty routine that she fails to look around her and understand that, wait a second, she's in an LGBT synagogue where there are people who are really transitioning, who are cutting par body parts mm -hmm. off, who are, um, I don't know, changing their... Th uh, and forgive me, I, do, I, I don't know the exact vocabulary of, you know, what is being cut off or, you know, remolded to... Um, yeah, yeah. To fit the new... Um, to, to fit the idea of what makes that person more authentic. Right. Um, 
and and that's how the story ends that her friend points out to her that you should look around you mm-hmm. you should see beyond your nose because uh you can live as that knows, but there are people around you who might not be so comfortable in their own bodies, but your nose is just fine. Yeah. Something that I really appreciate about the collection overall is even with the inspiration and the positivity and the lessons, the stories are, are never corny. They're mm-hmm. all <laughs> they're always <laughs> adult stories. Mm-hmm. They're always comedic in mm-hmm. some way. Uh, they're not pure tragedies. There's redeeming value, but but it's still, they're still very snappy. And mm-hmm. um, even Man of Fedora, which was mm-hmm. almost 30 pages, yep. I believe. That's the longest story. Yeah, ever. there's still mm-hmm. this this sort of bite-sized quality to them. And you had talked about poetry and flash fiction mm-hmm. before. Could you talk about, in terms of craft, how... Uh, you came to this collection and how you worked on each of these stories and and kept them condensed but still brought so much vibrancy to them and <laughs> and they're not one note is really what I'm trying to say <laughs> well because I'm so cognizant of the economy of language mm-hmm. I almost feel like I can't impose on the reader and I can't take more time that they, mm-hmm. than the re- average reader will allow me. I'm a reader myself, so I, I really find, I, I really resent when I pick up a book and it drags on. <laughs> <laughs> resent. <laughs> resent that. Uh, because I love to read, I love good literature, but when it's dragging and it's driving me crazy and it's I'm sleeping on it uh, uh, while turning the pages, it's not cool. So <laughs> I was writing with that in mind. Right. I want to entertain my reader. I want to make them think. I want to make them happy. Mm. Uh, I want to make them laugh. Mm. So l- humor is really important to me. I also want to make them think. And I don't want to impose too much on their time. So mm-hmm. uh, when I every story that I wrote, the even the long ones, even the long passages were there to entertain. Mm-hmm. Even the long passages had the humor, and um, uh, had the story, had the plot. They weren't just like meaningless musings and you know whining and stream of consciousness. <laughs> they were there on point. Yeah. And that was important to me. Uh, recently, uh, and I read a lot of, like, award winners. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Unfortunately, they're <laughs> the worst because... At one now, po- now, didn't no. this book win an award? <laughs> right. Uh, I read, I was reading a, a, an award winner of some, I don't remember, not, not like a Pulitzer. But okay, okay. A, a smaller award. And I was reading it, and I was like, I, see, I decided, you know what, I'm going to learn. I'm going to mm. learn from the best. And I'm reading, and I'm reading, and, like, I'm on page 10, I'm reading. I'm on page 20, and uh, somewhere on page 21, I had to put it down and, <laughs> and, and, and ask myself a question. Is this in English? Oh, no. <laughs> yes, because, because it was English words. It was English sentences, but none of it made any sense yeah so i don't know it felt like somebody had written this book in french (laughs) then put it through google translate and you know sometimes google translate is not a perfect oh yeah translation it's kind of like what i see english words but what and that was one of those books So what is your writing routine as somebody who really respects your reader's time? I yep. imagine you respect your own time. Uh, believe it or not, I, I, I have less respect for my own time <laughs> because I do a, about a billion revisions. Yeah. Um, I, I write a page, then I print it out, mm. and then I go through it, and then I with a pen. So I waste a lot of trees. I'm sorry. <laughs> I go through it with a pen. I cross out everything I don't like. I change it mm-hmm. on my computer. I print it out again. I, I, I leave it to, to hibernate for like overnight. Mm-hmm. Then in the morning I pick it up, pick up that page, and I'm like cross out some more. It's, it's painful. Yeah. It's painful. I go through a billion revisions, a billion. 
And then um, even when the story is fully written, and I'm like, okay, I, I leave it out. I leave it for a week. Then I come back after a week, and I print it out, and it's the same thing. Hmm. But in my defense, um, you know, there's a great writer, Lori Moore. She's like the queen of short story. So I saw her at the 92nd Street Y a couple of years ago. And somebody asked her a question. It was like full, full audience. Somebody asked her a question about revisions, how many revisions. And she said the same thing. She said, I go through a billion revisions. And sometimes, and she actually said, I couldn't stop laughing. She said, one time, even when the book comes out, it's yeah. already printed. She said, one time I walked into Barnes & Noble, picked up my own book, opened and uh, read uh, a, a random story, and I was like, this needs a period. <laughs> and she took a pen. She's in Barnes Noble. She took a pen, and she put a period there. And she even made a, she said, edited by the author. <laughs> Imagine you already, like the book is already in a bookstore, and you're still like, this needs a period. <laughs> so are you doing these revisions at your desk, somewhere else, out in the world? Because you travel, you go all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the way it works is usually a story uh, starts in my diary. I keep a diary. Mm -hmm. I've kept a diary since I was 12 years old. Talk about uh, examined life. <laughs> you know how there's a saying, an unexamined life is right. not worth living? Uh, this is a very examined <laughs> life. So I keep everything, like, I keep a diary, okay? Then that story, I could come back to a diary from 2010 mm. and find this segment and be like, this makes a good story because it stood the test, test of time. Mm. We're already in 2023. If it looks good, what I wrote in 2008, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type it on a laptop, uh, on my laptop. Then I'm going to put it into like a, a skeleton form mm -hmm. for a story. And then um, I'm kind of like a sculptor. I take, <laughs> like, I take a tree and I start cutting, cutting, carving, 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 carving. And so I take that skeleton and I start carving um, until it becomes a story. And then mm. once it becomes a story with a plot and everything, that's when I start working on the actual language. Mm -hmm. And I actually go through every board. Every word. <laughs> I know. I know. Every word. And then I say, I think to myself, is this the right word to express what I'm trying to say? And then I hone down on the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and then I re revise the ending. And then, but, but I, I do less revision on the ending because when I start writing a story, I already see it from the beginning to mm -hmm. the end. So there is usually no surprises there, there is no surprise at the end, but there could be some kind of a level of self-discovery mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle of the story. Because as I'm writing, my characters are growing. There's a character arch, but also I'm growing and developing and exploring as a writer. So there is, I, I leave that room for possibility within the story that mm -hmm. something could change. But it's not a huge uh change because the beginning and the end, the, I mean, the story plot remains, but there could be some kind of a revelation in the middle towards the end or whatever, but it's not, it doesn't change the trajectory of the story. Yeah. Overall, the stories seem to have almost a joke-like structure, like a punchline. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't surprise me that you already have that in of mind course. from the beginning. <laughs> yes. Uh, my editor, Jill Hoffman, had always said, oh, Marina, no, you need to write an ambiguity. And I was like, no, no, I cannot <laughs> write an ambiguity because, um, you know, sometimes you're reading a book and you know that that writer is writing an ambiguity mm -hmm. because it goes nowhere. No one knows where it's going, including the writer. <laughs> I, and, and, and the reader can feel that. Yeah. Um, and so I cannot write like that. Uh, 
I know where I'm going. I know where it's going, and that way, you know, I can plant clues in the beginning, in the in the middle, everywhere. That way, you know, I'm taking the, my reader along mm -hmm. for the ride, and I deliver him to the ending where there is some kind of a level of catharsis. Yeah. So evolving from poetry to flash fiction to a short story collection in your book life, mm -hmm. are you headed for longer form or what's the deal? What's next? <laughs> <laughs> Am I heading for like a novel? Yeah. Uh, well, the I, N word. I, the N word. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Um, hypothetically, I should be, but uh, I don't think I am ready. Mm. Or I'm I'm not emotionally there. I don't have a story to tell mm. that needs that kind of form. Um, I did write a novella that came out to about fifty pages, mm. fifty pages typewritten. Right. So that usually comes out to about a hundred, right? On a in a book style. Yes. Yes. So that's a novella. Uh, I could probably go back and revise it to make it better and better and better. This is only if you want to, right? I'm just curious because you were talking. Uh, you know, I am at that point of my life where I have five books behind me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, pl I'm toying with the idea that creativity does not have to stay in one yeah. In one theme. I, I know for a fact that you do a lot of stuff. Yes. You're, I don't know if we can talk about you, but you're a writer. We don't have a lot of time left, so let's keep no, it let's on you. you. You're a writer. You're a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. You do theater. You mm -hmm. do stand-up. Uh, I think you do fashion. <laughs> I think you you also All do right, journalism okay. and uh, Back to you, you also do Back political to activism. You. But the bottom line is what I'm trying, where I'm going with this yeah. is that why 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 should I pigeonhole myself into I'm a writer, and that's where my creativity is, and that's my, you know, uh, medium. Right. I am playing with the idea that creativity could come out in different forms. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, recently I've been very much into like fashion design. Right. I've been like into hat making, mm -hmm. and it really comes out extraordinary. And um, uh, y you know, I also paint. So, like, why? And I also make reels, and some of them, like, get 15,000 hits, yeah. 10,000 hits. And, you know, making reels is not, like, a, a, a dumb, you know, teenage uh, pastime. This is, like, film editing. Yeah, it's another it's, form of filmmaking. It's another form yeah. of expression, and I love it, and I'm actually very good at it. And I put my, you know, creative uh, pursuit into it, and I'm like, this is cool, and yeah. I almost don't feel like I need to be writing a new novel or, or whatever because, wait yeah. a second, my, ex my creativity uh, is satisfied with other forms. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? Tomorrow I could start singing for crying out loud. <laughs> I won't. I will not because <laughs> hey, who knows? I, don't, I don't have the voice for it. No, but I completely but, agree with you that there is this – pressure and I don't know if it's capitalism I don't know if it's the educational system here that there is this idea that you start at one point and you need to have an objective mm -hmm. and you build up to whatever that objective right. is right I mean um, you know there's a great uh, thinker and writer and philosopher Malcolm Gladwell who said you need 10,000 hours mm -hmm. to learn any skill so you know, I used to laugh at people in Hollywood who were like a singer, songwriter, actress, director, uh, model, and fashion designer. I was like, pick one and stick <laughs> there. Until now, when I realized, wait a second, no. I mean, if you are a creative person, it doesn't matter what form you are working in. It doesn't matter what your medium is, as long as you are uh, you are expressing your um vision yeah and that's how i feel right now maybe it's laziness talking <laughs> that says you know what i don't want to sit down at my laptop and as hemingway said there's nothing to writing all you do is sit at a typewriter and bleed <laughs> so maybe i'm kind of like i don't want to sit at a ty at a laptop and bleed um let me do something more fun like hmm. design a dress or design a hat or you know do something um something a little bit more 
interesting to me. <laughs> so we do have to wrap up. But for those who do want to follow your adventures and wherever your creativity <laughs> goes next, right. where should they find you? They can find me on Facebook, Marina Rubin. They can find me on Instagram. Uh, lots of reels there. <laughs> um, of course, they can Google me. And, you know, my book is on Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, Barnes & Noble. Of course, they can always purchase it from my uh, publisher, Krausnet. Crow's Nest books because it's always good to support an independent publisher. Yes. Um, buy directly from them. <laughs> buy directly from them. That's very because because that puts someone's kids through college. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Buy well, local. Yes. Buy local. Whatever um, you can. Absolutely. Well, thank you so thank much, you. Marina. I had a great time. Uh, yeah, I always do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for watching or listening to Badass Lady Folk. I'm your host, Christine Stoddard. Until next time.